that approximately one in four dogs at some stage in their life will likely develop cancer of some type. And half the dogs over the age of 10 will develop cancer. And we also know that it seems that dogs uh, get cancer at roughly the same rates or prevalence as do people. This is the James Cancer Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and today my guest is Dr. Rustin Moore, Dean of the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. What does this have to do with cancer? Well, it turns out a lot. The scientists and doctors of the James and the College of Veterinary Medicine work together quite often, collaborating on research, clinical trials, and advances in treatment that are extending and saving the lives of cancer patients and our beloved pets. It's a, it's a fascinating subject, and the collaboration here is a bit unique in the world of cancer research, and we're going to learn about that and how cancer affects our pets. Welcome to the podcast, Rustin. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Really uh, look forward to the conversation. Well, let's start off. We've talked a couple times. I've interviewed you a couple times. I never asked you this before. How did you get started on, decide on a career in veterinary medicine? Well, I have always wanted to be a veterinarian from probably around the time I was about six years of age. And that's not unusual for those who go into veterinary medicine. Most people decide by the time they're six to eight years of age that that's what they want to do. Uh, so I was on that path from an early age, and um, I think that's from where I grew up in rural West Virginia. So we certainly lived on a, a farm. Uh, but then, you know, as, as I went through undergrad and went on to veterinary school here at Ohio State, um, my interests changed with about every course and every, every uh, discipline. And uh, make a long story short, I ended up going into uh, equine surgery, uh, came back here after uh, a year away as a resident and PhD, and then I spent... 12 years at uh, Louisiana State University on faculty, came back here in 2006 into administration um, and uh, really decided that that was the best place for me because I could help more people and their, thus animals by helping uh, our faculty, staff, students, alumni, clients, and others. You know, that's interesting. You said that during your rotations through veterinary medical school, you were interested in all the different things and eventually settled on one. That's the exact same thing that I hear from the oncology physicians at, all, at, at the James, that they maybe went into med school thinking I'll be a pediatrician a, a, or a different kind of doctor, and they were drawn to a specific field of research, oncology in their cases. So same thing happens in veterinary medical school. Yeah, just one slight difference is um, we have to decide which species we're going to work on, too. <laughs> How, soon? How early in your training? Um, well, you don't have, I mean, you can actually go into general practice and a mixed animal practice and, and remain, remain a generalist for all domestic species, or you can decide at some point to go into zoo or wildlife, or you can focus in on a specific species like horses. Okay, so that sort of gives a good background, and let's talk about cancer and the prevalence of cancer in, in pets. And I'm guessing, although I'm not sure, that cats and dogs are probably the ones where the most research and, and treatment advances have, have come about. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly um, pretty much all domestic species are susceptible to certain types of cancer, but certainly dogs and cats are the ones that we see more of simply because the populations of dogs and cats in the United States are much higher than, say, horses or other species. But with regard to prevalence, uh, it's a bit difficult to say exactly because there is no national uh, re reporting required uh, for cancer in pets. Uh, there's no real uh, comprehensive databases or, or, or in some cases, the number of, of uh, or the, in some situations, the number of cases might not be sufficient to, uh, uh, to make reliable statements about it. However, we can make some general statements and that is that a approximately one in four dogs at some, some stage in their life will likely develop cancer of some type. Um, and half the dogs over the age of 10 will develop cancer. And we also know that it seems that dogs uh, get cancer at roughly the same rates or prevalence as do people. And as pets are living longer because of advances in veterinary medical care, uh, we know probably that as anybody or any animal, the longer they live, the more likely they could develop cancer. 
Um, and so the other thing is that, uh, you know, over the last 30 or so years, uh, we've really seen a change in the uh, culture and how people view pets. And, and probably uh, upward of 90% of people who have pets view them as part of their family. So they're more willing to seek diagnoses and therefore treatment. And so it may either um, accurately or it could be um, uh, just a, a, per, a perception that cancer is increasing in dogs and cats because people are bringing them to their veterinarians and, and seeking treatment. Yeah, that's a good point. Perhaps 30, 40, 50 years ago, dogs were maybe outside animals and people just didn't notice or seek treatment for what turned out to be cancer. And so it was never diagnosed. Right. And it's also interesting, it sounds like the same way that perhaps cancer starts in humans starts in dogs as the cells replicate and the DNA, uh, all the codes are regenerated over time as you get older, those little tiny changes, the body's immune system, the dog's immune system can't uh, detect or fight them in that, then the cancer starts. Yeah, we certainly know that cancer in dogs and cats behave very similarly from a biological perspective, response to treatment, um, and, you know, appear very similar, if not identical, uh, under the microscope when looking at biopsies. Um, and so they do seem to be very similar. And, and also, I think another important point is that, you know, particularly if we're talking about dogs and cats, uh, they are living in the house most of the time. So they are exposed to the same environment as the people. So, you know, they could be exposed to smoke or whatever other uh, potential carcinogens that might be present. Um, and so I, I think because of the similar environment that they're in and the similar uh, other, you know, uh, Bi uh, total bi body biology, et cetera, and what we know about, uh, you know, cells and um, how they might mutate, et cetera. Uh, certainly, uh, there are a lot of similarities between uh, why animals like dogs and cats might develop cancer, but also how the, the cancer itself uh, would proceed. Oh, that's interesting. And uh, in humans, uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer are the most prevalent types of cancer. How about in, in animals? Well, that's a really uh, good question. And it's, it's certainly a, a, the, the ones you mentioned. So uh, actually prostate cancer is not very common uh, in dogs, even though dogs have a prostate. Uh, and, you know, mammary cancer used to be quite high in dogs, but because uh, most female dogs who aren't going to be intended for breeding purposes are now, uh, now spayed. Um, and so we have seen a dramatic decrease in the incidence or prevalence of mammary cancer in dogs uh, because they have been neutered or, uh, or spayed. Wow. How does, that, how does that, the spading of, of female dogs prevent mammary cancer? Uh, because uh, mammary, mammary cancer in dogs, similar to uh, say in women, are uh, oftentimes uh, estrogen dependent. And so if, if the, if the ovaries and uterus are removed from a pet, uh, a dog, uh, before, you know, they actually reach puberty or even after they reach puberty, let's say by one year of age, uh, that actually is believed to be the link for decreasing the incidence because they don't have the sex hormones, estrogen, et cetera, that are circulating uh, because they aren't uh, coming into and going out of estrus. And I'm also guessing that or I shouldn't guess at these things, but lung cancer may not be as, as prevalent in animals. It's not as prevalent, but we do have a, a veterinary cancer researcher who studies uh, lung cancer in dogs as a model for lung cancer in people. Um, and so, as, you know, there's clearly different types of lung cancer. Uh, lung cancer is not one of the most common cancers we see in pets. Uh, particularly uh, dogs in this case, but certainly we do see it. The, the, the types of cancers that are most common in dogs that also might be uh, also relatively common in people would be things like lymphoma, uh, melanoma, uh, hemangiosarcoma, which you know, basically is um, uh, uh, tumors that arise in blood vessels. And in, in our case, we see it in the spleen, liver, uh, heart, and other places. Uh, I also mentioned the, uh, the mammary tumors, but 
The other uh, one that is a little unique, uh, there's two that are a little unique compared to people. One is, uh, although, although people and usually juveniles or adolescents and usually males more than females are, um, you know, uh, let's say predisposed to developing osteosarcoma or bone cancer, it is much greater uh, uh, prevalence in dogs, particularly large breed dogs uh, like greyhounds, Rottweilers, um, Great Danes, etc. And you know, it, it could be uh, several fold, uh, perhaps even 10 to 30 times as likely in a large breed dog as it is in a person. Wow, and, we, and I'm sure everyone has seen a, a dog where that has happened and they, an amputation is one of the things that has to be done. Yeah, um, yeah. dogs, uh, it's typically, uh, uh, the cancer typically occurs in the long bones, so the femur, the tibia, the radius, ulna, um, and usually it occurs in one leg, and um, the, the treatment now is definitely amputation, but also follow-up chemotherapy to try to treat any um, any p- potential metastases that have spread to other areas, typically the lung, and if we already see evidence of that um, at the time, the, that tends to decrease the, the prognosis for length of survival. Um, but you know, the, with treatment, um, the dogs actually do very well on three legs um, and can maneuver and, and be quite active. And the um, survival rate is quite dependent and the, the, the median survival time is, is variable depending on a variety of factors, but, you know, typically it's in the uh, going from uh, without any treatment, maybe two to four months up to perhaps a year. We've had some dogs uh, that have lived for about three years, but uh, many times it ends up uh, having spread to other organs, again, particularly the lungs. Now, before we start getting into some of these treatment advances, you mentioned melanoma, which is a little surprising to me. Is that the same way it happens in humans from exposure to the to the sun? Uh, Melanomas in dogs primarily occur in the mouth um, and also on the digits. So no, it's not, uh, it's not really related to uh, ultraviolet light. Um, However, in some species, we see uh, cats in particular, some horses that have certain pigment, uh, lack of pigment because of their color, uh, develop squamous cell carcinoma. Cats often will get that on, uh, particularly cats that have white hair, uh, they'll get um, squamous cell carcinoma on their, the pinna of their ears, uh, the, the, the nares or the front part of their nose, um, and other areas of lack of pigment. Horses get this around their eyes uh, on their conjunctiva, the sort of the mucous membrane inside the eye and other places uh, so that would be, that is more related to exposure to ultraviolet light. So the fur protects them and where they get the cancer is the areas where it's, there's no fur. Right. Wow. I, horses, I horses also, uh, particularly gray horses, uh, almost exclusively gray horses, uh, also develop melanomas. They tend to be cutaneous. Well, cutaneous, um, and they can occur about anywhere. They're typically not malignant. Uh, many times we don't treat them, uh, although we have some treatments. We treat them typically if they're in an area that, that is going to, say, interfere with function or, you know, uh, uh, the saddle or bridle or, or something like that. Are there certain types of dogs that, certain breeds of dogs that are more likely to get cancer than others? Well, although any breed uh, or any type of dog can develop cancer, um, there are certain breeds that seem to be more predisposed to certain types of cancer. So for example, uh, boxers uh, do tend to be more highly predisposed to developing lymphoma. Golden retrievers may also be more prone to developing lymphoma, but also things like the soft tissue sarcomas or uh, hemangiosarcoma. Large breed dogs like greyhounds, golden um, Rottweilers, Great Danes are certainly more predisposed to developing bone cancer. So yes, there are a variety of breeds that seem to have a a predisposition to certain cancers. So in humans, you go by your family history. And if you have a family history of uh, breast cancer or colon cancer, you would get earlier screenings. You can't really 
or you, I don't know if you can do that in dogs, maybe not, but you have a breed history. Does that lead to perhaps more frequent screenings? Yeah, absolutely. This has become something that's a, a more recent and, and I think is growing uh, more. And this is, uh, let's say a family has had a long history of having uh, a certain breed. Let's pick a golden retriever, because uh, which are, you know, typically uh, uh, one of the most popular breeds in the U.S. And so they've had them over the years and they have one that developed uh, lymph, uh, lymphoma or perhaps they developed uh, hemangiosarcoma. We now have clients who are pet parents when they get a new golden retriever or whatever breed it may be, are asking us to do annual screenings. And the annual screening would entail obviously a comprehensive physical exam, but also depending upon the breed and what kind of cancer you might be looking for, it could be that there uh, we're doing uh, screening of uh, abdominal ultrasound to look for evidence of angiosarcoma say on the spleen or liver or other organs, or it could be say in a large breed dog that were uh, taking radiographs uh, of their long bones to try to detect the, the likelihood of development of osteosarcoma so that it could be caught earlier and treated more successfully. Okay, we're gonna take a quick break. And when we come back, we're gonna dive into the treatment side of cancer in pets. And then also a little bit about how um, scientists at the uh, vet, vet hospital and the James Hospital work together. A revolution in lung cancer treatment is happening at the James. We're proving lung cancer isn't solely defined by location and stage, but rather the individual molecules and genes that drive it. Simply put, there is no routine lung cancer. That's why our world-renowned specialists put their expertise towards treating one particular lung cancer, yours. At the James, we go beyond the routine to prevent, detect, treat, and cure your lung cancer. To learn more, call 1-800-293-5066. We're back with Rustin Moore, Dean of the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And Rustin, let's dive into the whole world of diagnosing and treating pets with cancer, and I'm sure how it's evolved over the years and during your career? Sure, so um, in general, a general statement I would say is that both the diagnostic approach and treatment options uh, in general are very similar between people and animals. What I mean by that on the diagnostic side is clearly most of the time uh, there's an initial diagnosis made through uh, a, a good take, history taking and physical exam you know, are they having pain, you know, whatever, and, and then also doing your exam. But then after that, the diagnostics uh, are much, much the same. So uh, many types of imaging. So for everything from standard radiographs, uh, ultrasound, particularly for abdominal uh, cavity uh, tumors, uh, and also more advanced imaging like uh, CT or CAT scan uh, and MRI. And even recently, uh, we've partnered with uh, folks on the human side to do some PET CTs. Um, and that's really more to look for where all the tumor may be and has it spread or metastasized to other parts of the body. Of course, we also rely on things like cytology and uh, evaluation of biopsies uh, with histology or even special stains, uh, flow cytometry for certain types of blood cancers. Um, and then Although there's more of these on the human side, there are a few and likely over time will be more where we can look at genetic tests or other things to look for certain um, mutations or whatever that might help identify not just the specific type of tumor, but uh, variants of that specific tumor. Wow, the way you explain it, vets have to be amazing diagnosti diagnosticians because their patients can't say, I have a headache. Or, uh, or my, I have a bad cough. They have to, they have to be amazing diagnost diagnosticians. It's a word I have a problem pronouncing, but they have to diagnose things without the advantages that human doctors have. Well, what's really important is they have to be good listeners because they have to listen to the client, the pet parent or the, the uh, owner, because they could say, my pet has been coughing for the last two months. 
Uh, I've noticed my uh, dog circling or having abnormal behavior, which might clue them in that it could have a brain tumor or that, it, you know, my dog has started to have GI signs. It's, you know, it's losing weight. It doesn't have a good appetite, et cetera, which could be a sign potentially of, of uh, gastrointestinal. It could be that my dog started limping last week uh, and it'd be a sign of some type of bone tumor like osteosarcoma. So it's really about listening carefully and then trying to put all that together with your physical exam and then move forward for your uh, more advanced diagnostics to confirm and uh, determine exactly what type of cancer it is. That's a great point. Listening is a skill that makes for a good doctor no matter who your patient is. So let's move on a little bit to treatment and talk about the advances, where we are and, and where we're going. Well, we've certainly come a long way in the last 30 years. Uh, I remember when I was a veterinary student uh, back then um, that we were actually treating some pets with, um, uh, with cancer in, with, in various ways, but those have certainly uh, evolved and improved over the last three decades and probably more so in the last decade. But the, the way we approach treatment is not that indifferent from what we would do in people depending upon the type of cancer. So that would be everything from surgically removing, uh, if that's possible, and trying to get clean margins. Uh, maybe that's a type of skin tumor or something else. Uh, it could be surgical debulking uh, that might need to be done. We typically would then, uh, that would be um, complemented or supplemented with some type of standard chemotherapy. So chemotherapeutic agents that actually kill rapidly dividing cells like cancer cells uh, and then also radiation therapy for certain types of radiosensitive tumors. But more recently, uh, just like in, in people, you know, there have been development of, say, small molecule inhibitors, uh, different types of immunotherapy. Um, and many of these, well, some of these are available in you know, general practice. But most of the time, these types of treatments for uh, pets or even horses are, are at more tertiary referral uh, academic medical centers where there is a, a group of people that work together in both or in uh, medical, surgical and radiation oncology, uh, working with the, the diagnostic imaging folks, the pathologists, et cetera, to really get uh, a, a diagnosis, uh, also includes staging of, of the tumor to know where it is and where it might have spread. Uh, and working together like that, then they can develop a an appropriate and sometimes multimodal approach to treatment with the things that I mentioned. So if I'm understanding correctly, and I, I think I am, because this happened to us with our, our cat, you, you get the diagnosis at your local vet, who's going to then refer you to the specialists at, at Ohio State. Yeah, usually they're diagnosed by uh, uh, your family veterinarian, the general practitioner, uh, and they may do that based upon either, the, you know, as I said before, the history, the physical exam, maybe even some initial diagnostics. And then if the, if the pet parent wants to pursue advanced diagnostics and potential treatment, they're usually referred to a, a specialist group. Now, first, before we move on to that, I'm very curious with chemotherapy, the side effects in human patients, loss of hair, loss of appetite, fatigue, are they similar in, in pets? Some of them are similar. Uh, however, you know, with chemotherapy, most of the time pets don't lose their hair. Um, with radiation therapy, they can, uh, depending upon where it is and how intense and how often and frequent it has to be done. Um, they do develop, um, uh, in many instances, um, low white blood cell counts, which makes them more at risk for infections. Uh, and certainly we monitor that very carefully. So, so, so if a, a dog was coming in for um, chemotherapy and it was on a standard regimen, we, we always do a complete blood count prior to giving the next dose to make sure that their white blood cell count isn't already too low. Some uh, dogs uh, and cats do have other side effects. Some of them could, um, have uh, GI side effects, you know, diarrhea and things like that. But, um, and certainly with cancer itself, not just with the, the treatments, uh, you know, certainly inappetence, weight loss, et cetera, can occur. But uh, I would say similar, but 
dogs and cats, animals in general, tend to be a, a little bit more tolerant of everything, including pain. It uh, doesn't mean they don't feel pain. I don't want to uh, suggest that, but they seem to have a perhaps a higher threshold. Um, and so uh, I would say similar, but yet some differences. So let's jump ahead. What's going on with clinical trials that you're doing on your own that you're working with uh, people at the James on? Well, first of all, we do have and have had for uh, over a decade a, a veterinary clinical trials office. Actually, it's referred to as the Blue Buffalo Veterinary Clinical Trials Office because the Blue Buffalo Company did endow that program uh, a few years ago, which allows us to have the funds uh, necessary to help maintain, operate, and sustain that, including the people that are there. Uh, what we, we typically have 40 to 50 trials that we uh, do per year uh, and might uh, see anywhere between, say, 500 and 800 patients being enrolled. Not all of those are cancer trials. Uh, some of them could be trials in, for other reasons, but generally I would say 40 to 50% of those trials uh, are for cancer. And those many times are trials looking at new potential therapeutics. And those typically are therapeutics that uh, are in the pipeline for potential use in people. What we know with dogs is because, as I mentioned earlier, um, the biologic behavior in response to uh, treatment for uh, tumors in dogs is uh, very similar to people. And so we, uh, these dogs with naturally acquired spontaneous cancer serve as wonderful models of how a person with the same cancer might respond to a given new therapy. And what we do know is that it takes lots of time, oftentimes years and many thousands, millions or billions of dollars uh, to get certain drugs through the pipeline. And so uh, by, by being able to, after appropriate safety testings, get these into, the, into animals, primarily dogs, to look at whether or not it helps uh, either um, you know, shrink the tumor, preserve um, length of life, quality of life, et cetera. By doing that, not only do we uh, provide access to that pet parent for the latest, the potential latest, greatest new uh, therapeutics, it also can help us uh, for pets in the future, but also can give uh, really important data for uh, the, the, the pipeline in people. And what they sort of know now is um, they really call it a go, no go. If, if a particular therapy doesn't work in a dog with a similar type of tumor, they're not likely not to proceed on the human side because uh, it's, you know, if it doesn't work in a dog, it's highly unlikely to work in a person. And so they can save time and money by stopping that and going in, you know, and testing other pipeline medications. But say for example, you know, lymphoma in a dog and lymphoma in people, uh, osteosarcoma in dogs or osteosarcoma in uh, adolescent uh, boys and, and girls. So yes, yeah, same types of tumors, sometimes same location, but not always the same location uh, in the body of where that tumor might arise. So how do you, do you work with, on these clinical trials on your own or some of them with James people? Our clinical trials in cancer um, are uh, with multiple potential other investigators. We have had a number of situations um, where we have worked on drugs or therapies that have uh, been developed uh, at Ohio State, whether it's the College of Pharmacy or, or others. And as you know, uh, many people at Ohio State who are part of the Comprehensive Cancer Center are spread all across the campus uh, in various colleges and units. So uh, drugs that might be developed by the College of Pharmacy in collaboration with others in the health sciences uh, could be something that we would do a clinical trial, say in dogs with, with a naturally acquired type of cancer that they're looking at that uh, in people. We also get funding from um, uh, animal health foundations and others that provide uh, the opportunity for us to look at uh, drugs that might be actually uh, in the pipeline for people, but we don't have access to them. And so we're, we're looking at them specifically uh, to see how they might work in a, in a person. But yes, highly collaborative 
And we do that with uh, folks from the Comprehensive Cancer Center, the James, and also Nationwide Children's Hospital. Uh, we have uh, an active partnership with them, particularly around osteosarcoma, because as, a, as I said earlier, there's about uh, a 10 to 30 times greater likelihood a large breed dog will develop uh, osteosarcoma than in a person, uh, in an in a adolescent. And so by having that prevalence, it it's actually gives us more cases to study uh, these things. And there's a, actually a collaboration right now uh, between us and those at Nationwide Children's looking at um, uh, natural killer cell therapy. Um, so actually administering or infusing natural killer cells, NK cells, into dogs with osteosarcoma. And the natural killer cells are part of the body's immune system, right? Correct. We've had some other examples over the years on the research side. Certainly, uh, we've worked closely with Dr. John Bird. Uh, we conducted a, a clinical trial in dogs with lymphoma some, some time ago to evaluate uh, a BTK inhibitor. Uh, and actually, that contributed, that data that we did in that clinical trial actually was helpful and contributed to the eventual uh, FDA approval of that drug uh, for people. Uh, we also have uh, been uh, the leading uh, site for accruing um, uh, uh, clinical trial data uh, on uh, rampamycin, um, which is a, an inhibitor uh, of some cancers, uh, and that's been uh, done in dogs with osteosarcoma as well. And then there's, uh, there's several other examples of things that have been done and also are currently in the works. Um, Dr. Kizaberth and uh, another of our oncologists, Dr. Eric Green, who is a radiation oncologist, have been working with radiation oncologists um, uh, at the James to evaluate the potential use of flash therapy or, or flash radiotherapy uh, in dogs and actually possibly in horses uh, for um, types of tumors that would be on the surface, like on the skin, some of those that I mentioned earlier, squamous cell carcinoma, melanoma, and some of those. Wow, that's fascinating because we, we've done a podcast on the new photon radiation center that the James will have, and now there's going to be an, another w way to utilize it. So how rare is this? I know that you're one of the largest and best uh, veterinary colleges in the country, I guess the world. How rare is this, all this collaboration with the James, with Nationwide Children's, with your uh, college and your scientists? And is it, is it done at other places to this extent? We will continue to make incremental progress in how we can uh, treat, uh, perhaps sent, put into remission, perhaps even cure uh, cancers in animals and people because we're working together uh, in a collaborative and comparative way. Um, you know, so it's, I look at it as a win-win and, uh, we certainly, we know cancer science or cancer research, um, and, and research in general is a team sport. So team science is so important, um, uh, in anything we do in biomedical research. And so I think, uh, we're uniquely situated. And I also want to just give a shout out to the Comprehensive Cancer Center and the James for being so receptive to working with us as veterinarians and, and understanding the win-win and how valuable um, our animals with spontaneous cancer are to the research mission. And also that includes financial support uh, in terms of startup monies for new faculty that are cancer researchers, as well as uh, for facility laboratory uh, research laboratory renovations and modernization. So we could not ask for a better partner than those associated with the Comprehensive Cancer Center in the James. Wow, it sounds like a great partnership that benefits uh, both of you as well as people and pets. It's a it's win win for everybody. Yeah, and our motto at our college is "Be the model," which means "Be the model Comprehensive College of Veterinary Medicine in the world." And I would say that our relationship and partnership with the James and the Comprehensive Cancer Center is a be the model partnership or collaboration. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for being on the podcast. And it's a little different topic today, but to me, just fascinating and exciting for the future. So thanks for joining us and filling us in on all the great advances that are helping our pets out there in the world. 
Well, thank you for having me and your interest in this sort of uh, collaborative uh, approach uh, to cancer care in both people and, and their pets. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.